Chapter 6 The Busher Beats It Hence Chicago, Illinois, October 20. Friend Al. I guess maybe you will begin to think I don't never do what I am going to do and that I change my mind a whole lot because I wrote and told you that I and Flory and little Al would be in Bedford today and here we are in Shy yet on the day when I told you we would get to Bedford and I bet Bertha and you and the rest of the boys will be disappointed but Al I don't feel like as if I should ought to leave the White Sox in a hole and that is why I am here yet and I will tell you how it come off but in the first place I want to tell you that it won't make a difference of more than five or six or maybe seven days at least and we will be down there and see you and Bertha and the rest of the boys just as soon as the New York Giants and the White Sox leaves here and starts around the world. Also I remember I told you to fix it up so as a hack would be down to the depot to meet us tonight and you won't get this letter in time to tell them not to send no hack so I suppose the hack will be there but maybe they will be somebody else that gets off of the train that will want to hack, and then everything will be all okay. But if they is not nobody else that wants to hack, I will pay them half of what they was going to charge me if I had have came and rode into hack, though I don't have to pay them nothing because I am not going to ride into hack. But I want to do the right thing, and besides I will want to hack at the depot when I do come, so they will get a piece of money out of me anyway, so I don't see where they got no kick coming, even if I don't give them a nickel now. I will tell you why I am still here, and you will see where I am trying to do the right thing. You note, of course, that the White Sox and the New York Giants was going to make a trip round the world, and they've been after me for a long time to go along with them, but I says, no, I would not leave Flory and the kid, because that would not be fair. Besides, I would be paying rent and groceries for them somewheres and me not getting nothing out of it. And besides, I would probably be spending a whole lot of money on the trip because though the clubs pays all of our regular expenses, they would be a whole lot of times when I felt like blowing myself and buying something to send home to the missus and to good old friends of mine like you and Bertha. So I turned them down and Callahan acted like he was sore at me. But I don't care nothing for that because I got other people to think about and not Callahan. And besides, if I was to go along, the fans in the towns where we play at would want to see me work, and I would have to do a whole lot of pitching, which I would not be getting nothing for it, and it would not count in no standing, because the games is to be just for fun. And what good would it do me? And besides, Flory says I was not under no circumstances to go. And of course, I would go if I wanted to go, no matter whatever she says, but all in all, I turned them down and says I would stay here all winter, or rather, I would not stay here but in Bedford. Then Callahan says, All right, but you know, before we start on the trip, the Giants and us is going to play a game right here in Shoy next Sunday. And after what you done in the city, Sirius, the fans would be sore if they did not get no more chance to look at you. So will you stay and pitch part of the game here? And I says, I would think it over and I come home to the hotel where we are staying at and asked Flory, did she care if we did not go to Bedford for another week? And she says, no, she did not care if we don't go for six years. So I called Callahan up and says, I would stay. And he says, that's my boy. And now the fans will have another treat. So you see, Al, he appreciates what I done and wants to give the fans fair treatment because this town is nuts over me after what I done to them Cubs, but I could do it just the same to the Athletics or anybody else if it would have been them instead of the Cubs. Maybe we will leave here the a.m. after the game that is Monday, and I will let you know so as you can order another hack and tell Bertha I hope she did not go to no extra trouble about getting ready for us and did not order no spare ribs and kraut, but you can eat them up if she already got them, and maybe she can order some more for us when we come, but tell her it don't make no difference and not to go to no trouble, because most anything she has is okay for Flory and I, except, of course, we would not to make no meal off of sardines or something. Well, Al, I bet them New York Giants will wish I would have went home before they come for this here exhibition game, because my arm feels great, and I will show them where they would be at if they had to play ball in our league all the time though I suppose they is some pitchers in our league that they would hit good against them if they can hit at all, but not me. You will see in the papers how I come out, and I will write and tell you about it. Your pal, Jack. 
Chicago, Illinois, October 25th. Old pal. I have not only got a little time, but I have got some news for you, and I know you would want to hear all about it, so I am writing this letter, and then I am going to catch the train. I would be saying goodbye to little Al instead of writing this letter, only Florrie won't let me wake him up, and he is asleep, but maybe by the time I get this letter wrote, he will be awake again, and I can say goodbye to him. I am going with the White Sox and Giants as far as San Francisco, or maybe Vancouver, where they take the boat at, but I am not going around the world with them, but only just out to the coast to help them out, because there is a couple of men going to join them out there, and until them men join them, they will be short of men, and they got a whole lot of exhibition games to play before they get out there, so I am going to help them out. It all come off in the clubhouse after the game today, and I will tell you how it come off, but first I want to tell you about the game, and honest Al, them Giants is the luckiest team in the world, and it is not no wonder they keep winning the pennant in that league, because a club that has got their luck could win ball games without sending no team on the field at all, but staying down to the hotel. They was a big crowd out to the park, so Callahan says to me, I did not know if I was going to pitch you or not, but the crowd is out here to see you, so I will have to let you work. So I warmed up, but I knowed the minute I throwed the first ball warming up that I was not right, and I says to Callahan I did not feel good, but he says, You won't need to feel good to beat this bunch, because I heard a whole lot about you, and you would have them beat if you just throwed your glove out there in the box. So I went in and tried to pitch, but my arm was so lame it pretty near killed me every ball I throwed, and I bet if I was some other pitchers, they would not never have tried to work with my arm so sore. But I am not like some of them yellow dogs and quit, because I would not disappoint the crowd or throw Callahan down when he wanted me to pitch and was depending on me. You know me, Al. So I went in there, but I did not have nothing, and if them giants could have hit it all, instead of like a lot of little girls, they would have knocked down the fence, because I was not myself. At that, they should not ought to have had only the one run off of me if Weaver and them had not have begun kicking the ball around like it was a football or something. Well, Al, what with dropping fly balls and booting them around and this and that, the Giants was gave five runs in the first three innings, and they should ought to have had just the one run, or maybe not that. And that ball Merkel hit into the seats, I was trying to waste it, and a man that is a good hitter would not never have hit at it, and if I was right, this here Merkel could not foul me in nine years. When I was coming into the bench after the third inning, this here smart Alec McGraw come past me from the third base coaching line, and he says, Are you going on this trip? And I says, No, I am not going on no trip. And he says, That's too bad, because if you was going, we would win a whole lot of games. And I give him a hot comeback, and he did not say nothing. So I went into the bench, and Callahan says, Them joints is not such rotten hitters, is they? And I says, No, they hit pretty good when a man has got a sore arm against them. And he says, Why did you not tell me your arm was sore? And I says, I did not want to disappoint no crowd that come out here to see me. And he says, well, I guess you need not pitch no more, because if I left you in there, the crowd might begin to get tired of watching you about ten o'clock tonight. And I says, what do you mean? And he did not say nothing more, so I sat there a while and then went to the clubhouse. Well, Al, after the game, Callahan come in to the clubhouse, and I was still in there yet, talking to the trainer and getting my arm rubbed. And Callahan says, are you getting your arm in shape for next year? And I says, no, but it give me so much pain I could not stand it. And he says, I bet if you was feeling good, you could make those giants look like a sucker. And I says, you know I could make them look like a sucker. And he says, well, why don't you come along with us, and you'll get another chance at them when you feel good. And I says, I would like to get another crack at them, but I could not go away on no trip and leave the missus and the baby, and then he says he would not ask me to make the whole trip around the world, but he wished I would go out to the coast with them, because they was hard up for pitchers, and he says Matthewson of the Giants was not only going as far as the coast, so if the Giants had their star pitcher that far, 
The White Sox should ought to have Darren, and then some of the other boys coaxed me would I go. So finally I says, I would think it over. And I went home and seen Florrie, and she says, How long would it be for? And I says, About three or four weeks. And she says, If you don't go, will we start for Bedford right away? And I says, Yes. And then she says, All right, go ahead and go. But if they was anything should happen to the baby while I was gone, what would they do if I was not around to tell them what to do? And I says, Call a doctor in, but don't call no doctor if you don't have to. And besides, you should ought to know by this time what to do for the baby when he got sick. And she says, Of course, I know a little, but not as much as you do, because you know it all. Then I says, No, I don't know it all, but I will tell you some things before I go, and you should not ought to have no trouble. So we fixed it up, and her and little Al is to stay here in the hotel until I come back which will be about the 20th of November, and then we will come down home and tell Bertha not to get too impatient, and we will get there sometime. It is going to cost me $6 a week at the hotel for a room for she and the baby, besides their meals, but the baby's meals don't cost nothing yet, and Flory should not ought to be very hungry, because we've been living good, and besides, she will get all she can eat when we come to Bedford, and it won't cost me nothing for meals on the trip out to the coast, because Comiskey and McGraw pays for that. I have not even had no time to look up where we play at, but we stop off at a whole lot of places on the way, and I will get a chance to make them giants look like a sucker before I get through, and McGraw won't be so sorry I am not going to make the whole trip. You will see by the papers what I done to them before we get through, and I will write as soon as we stop somewheres long enough so as I can write. And now I am going to say goodbye to little Al, if he is awake or not awake, and wake him up and say goodbye to him, because even if he is not only five months old, he is old enough to think a whole lot of me, and why not? I also got to say goodbye to Flory, and fix it up with the hotel clerk about she and the baby staying here a while, and catch the train. You will hear from me soon, old pal, your pal Jack. St. Joe, Mississippi, October 29. Friend Al. Well, Al, we are on our way to the coast, and they is quite a party of us, though it is not no real White Sox and Giants at all, but some players from off of both clubs, and then some others that is from other clubs around the two leagues to fill up. We got Speaker from the Boston Club and Crawford from the Detroit Club, and if we had them with us all the time, Al, I would not never lose a game because one or the other of them two is good for a couple of runs every game, and that is all I need to win my games is a couple of runs, or only one run, and I would win all my games and would not never lose a game. I did not pitch today, and I guess the Giants was glad of it, because no matter what McGraw says, he must have saw from watching me Sunday that I was a real pitcher, though my arm was so sore I could not hardly raise it over my shoulder, so no wonder I did not have no stuff, but at that I could have beat his gang without no stuff, if I had have had some kind of decent support. I will pitch against him maybe tomorrow, or maybe some day soon, and my arm is all okay again now, so I will show them up and make them wish Callahan had have left me to home. Some of the men has brung their wife along, and besides that there is some other men and their wife that is not no ball players, but are going along for the trip and some more will join the party out the coast before they get aboard the boat. But of course I and Matthewson will drop out of the party then, because why should I or him go around the world and throw our arms out pitching games that don't count no standing, and that we don't get no money for pitching them outside of just our bare expenses? The people in the towns we played at so far has all wanted to shake hands with Matthewson and I, so I guess they know who is the real pitchers on these here two clubs, no matter what them reporters says, and the stars is always the men that the people wants to shake their hands with and make friends with them. But Al, this here Matthewson pitched today, and honest Al, I don't see how he gets by. And either the batters in the National League don't know nothing about hitting, or else he is such an old man that they feel sorry for him, and maybe when he was about ten years younger than he is, maybe then he had something and was a pretty fair pitcher, but all he does now is stick the first ball right over with nothing on it and pray that they don't hit it out of the park. If a pitcher like Key can get by in the National League and fool them batters, 
They is not nothing I would like better than to pitch in the National League and I bet I would not get scored on in two to three years. I heard a whole lot about this here fade away that he is supposed to pitch and it is a ball that is throwed out between two fingers and falls in at a right hand batter and they is not nobody can't hit it. But if he throwed one of them things today he done it while I was asleep and they was not no time when I was not wide awake and looking right at him. And after the game was over, I says to him, Where is that fade away I heard so much about? And he says, Oh, I did not have to use none of my regular stuff against your club. And I says, Well, you would have to use all you got if I was working against you. And he says, Yes, if you worked like you done Sunday, I would have to do some pitching or they would not never finish the game. Then I says about me having a sore arm Sunday, and he says, I wished I had a sore arm like yourn, and a little sense with it, and was your age, and I would not never lose a game. So you see, Al, he has heard about me and is jealous, because he has not got my stuff. But they can't everybody expect to have the stuff that I got, or half as much stuff. This smart Alec McGraw was trying to kid me today, and says, Why did not I make friends with Matthewson and let him learn me something about pitching? And I says, Matthewson could not learn me nothing. And he says, I guess that's right. And I guess there is not nobody could learn you nothing about nothing. And if you was to stay in the league 20 years, probably you would not be no better than you are now. So you see, he had to admit that I am good, Al, even if he has not saw me work when my arm was okay. McGraw says to me, Tonight, he says, I wished you was going all the way. And I says, yes, you do. I says, your club would look like a sucker after I had worked against them a few times. And he says, maybe that's right, too, because they would not know how to hit against a regular pitcher after that. Then he says, but I don't care nothing about that. But I wish you was going to make the whole trip so as we could have a good time. He says, we got Steve Evans and Duck Schaefer going along, and they is both of them funny. But I like to be around with boys that is funny and don't know nothing about it. I says, well, I would go along only for my wife and baby. And he says, yes, it would be pretty tough on your wife to have you away that long. But still in all, think how glad she would be to see you when you come back again. And besides, them dolls across the ocean will be pretty sore at I and Callahan if we tell them we left you to home. I says, do you suppose the people over there has heard about me? And he says, sure, because they have wrote a lot of letters asking to be sure to bring you and Matthewson along. Then he says, I guess Matthewson is not going, so if you was to go and him left here to home, there would be nothing to it. You could have things all your own way and probably could marry the Queen of Europe if you was not already married. He was giving me the straight dope this time, Al, because he did not crack a smile and I wished I could go along, but it would not be fair to Flory. But still and all, did not she leave me and beat it for Texas last winter? And why should not I do the same thing to her? Only I am not that kind of man. You know me, Al. We play in Kansas City tomorrow and maybe I will work there because it is a big town. And I have got to close now and write to Flory. Your old pal Jack. Abilene, Texas, November 4. Al, well, Al, I guess you know by this time that I have worked against them two times since I wrote to you last time, and I beat them both times. And McGraw knows now what kind of pitcher I am, and I will tell you how I know, because after the game yesterday, he rode down to the place we dressed at a long time with me, and all the way in the automobile, he was after me to say I would go all the way around the world and finally it come out that he wants I should go along and pitch for his club and not pitch for the White Sox. He says his club is up against it for pitchers because Matthewson is not going and all they got left is a man named Hem that is a young man and not got no experience and Wiltsy that is a left-hander. So he says, I have talked it over with Callahan and he says if I could get you to go along it was all okay with him and you could pitch for us only I must not work you too hard, because he is dependent on you to win the pennant for him next year. I says, 
Did not none of the other White Sox make no holler because maybe they might have to bat against me? And he says, Yes, Crawford and Speaker says they would not make the trip if you was along and pitching against them. But Callahan showed them where it would be good for them next year. Because if they hit against you all winter, the pitchers they hit against next year will look easy to them. He was crazy to have me go along on the whole trip, but of course, Al, there is not no chance of me going on account of Flory and little Al. But you see, McGraw has cut out his trying to kid me and is treating me now like a man should ought to be treated that has done what I done. They was not no game here today on account of it raining, and the people here was sore because they did not see no game, but they all come around to look at us and says they must have some speeches from the most prominent men in the party, so I and Comiskey and McGraw and Callahan and Matthewson and Ted Sullivan, that I guess is putting up the money for the trip, made speeches, and they clapped their hands harder when I was making my speech than when any one of the others was making their speech. You did not know I was a speech maker, did you, Al? And I did not know it neither until today. But I guess there is not nothing I can do if I make up my mind. And one of the boys says that I done just as well as Dummy Taylor could have. I have not heard nothing from Flory, but I guess maybe she is too busy taking care of little Al to write no letters. And I am not worrying none, because she give me her word she would let me know was they something to matter. Yours truly, Jack. San Diego, California, November 9. Friend Al. Al, sometimes I wished I was not married at all. And if it was not for Flory and little Al, I would go around the world on this here trip. And I guess the boys in Bedford would not be jealous if I was to go around the world and see everything they is to be saw. And some of the boys down home has not never been no farther away than Terre Haute. And I don't mean you, Al, but some of the other boys. But of course, Al, when a man has got a wife and a baby, there is not no chance for him to go away on one of these here trips and leave them alone. So there is not no use I should even think about it. But I can't help thinking about it because the boys keeps after me all the time to go. Callahan was talking about it to me today, and he says he knowed that if I was to pitch for the Giants on the trip, his club would not have no chance of winning the most of the games on the trip. But still in all, he wished I would go along because he was a scared the people over in Rome and Paris and Africa and them other countries would be awful sore if the two clubs come over there without bringing none of their star pitchers along. He says, We got Speaker and Crawford and Doyle and Tharp and some of them other real stars in all of the positions except pitcher. And it will make us look bad if you and Matthewson don't neither one of you come along. I says, what is the matter with Scott and Benz and this here left-hander Wiltsey? And he says, There is not nothing the matter with none of them, except there is not no real stars like you and Matthewson. And if we can show them foreigners, one or two of you, we will feel like we was cheating them. I says, You would not want me to pitch my best against your club, would you? And he says, Oh, no. We would not want you to pitch your best or get yourself all wore out for next year. But I would want you to let up enough so as we could make a run once in a while so the games would not be too one-sided. I says, well, there is not no use talking about it because I could not leave my wife and baby. And he says, why don't you write and ask your wife and tell her how it is and can you go? I says, no, because she would make a big holler. And besides, of course, I would go anyway if I wanted to go, without no yes or no from her. Only I am not the kind of man that runs off and leaves his family. And besides, there is not nobody to leave her with, because her and her sister Alan's wife has had a quarrel. Then Callahan says, Where is Alan now? Is he still in Shoy? I says, I don't know where he is at, and I don't care where he is at, because I am through with him. Then Callahan says, I oh, asked him would he go on the trip before the season was over, but he says he could not, and if I'd knowed where was he, I would wire a telegram to him and ask him again. I says, what would you want him along for? And he says, because McGraw is shy of pitchers, and I says I would try and help him find one. 
I says well you should ought not to have no trouble finding a man like Allen to go along because his wife probably would be glad to get rid of him. Then Callahan says well I wish you would get a hold of where Allen is at and let me know so I can wire him a telegram. Well Al I know where Allen is at all okay but I am not going to give his address to Callahan because McGraw has treated me all okay and why should I wish a man like Allen on him and besides I am not going to give Allen no chance to go around the world or nowhere else after the way he acted about I and Florey having a room in his flat and asking me to pay for it when he give me an invitation to come there and stay. Well Al it is too late now to cry in the sour milk but I wish I had not never saw Florey until next year and then I and her could get married just like we done last year only I don't know would I do it again or not but I guess I would on account of little Al. Your pal Jack. San Francisco, California, November 14. Old pal. Well, old pal, what do you know about me being back here in San Francisco, where I give the fans such a treat two years ago, and then I was not nothing but a busher, and now I am with a team that is going around the world and are crazy to have me go along, only I can't because of my wife and baby. Callahan wired a telegram to the reporters here from Los Angeles telling them I would pitch here and I guess they is going to be 20 or 25,000 out to the park and I will give them the best I got. But what do you think Flory has did Al? Her and the Allens has made it up their quarrel and his friends again and Marie told Flory to write and tell me she was sorry we had that there argument and let bygones be bygones. Well Al it is all okay with me because I can't help not feeling sorry for Allen, because I don't believe he will be in the league next year. And I feel sorry for Marie, too, because it must be pretty tough on her to see how well her sister done and what a mistake she made when she went and fell for a left-hander that could not fool a blind man with his curveball, and if he was to hit a man in the head with his fastball, they would think their nose itched. In Florrie's letter, she says she thinks us and the Allens could find another flat like the one we had last winter and all live in it together instead of going to Bedford. But I have wrote to her before I started writing this letter already and told her that her and I is going to Bedford and the Allens can go where they feel like and they can go and stay on a boat on Michigan Lake all winter if they want to, but I and Florrie is coming to Bedford. Down to the bottom of her letter, she says Allen wants to know if Callahan or McGraw is shy of pitchers, and maybe he would change his mind and go along on the trip. Well, Al, I did not ask either Callahan nor McGraw nothing about it, because I know they was looking for a star, and not for no left-hander that could not break a pane of glass with his fast one, so I wrote and told Flory to tell Allen they was all filled up and would not have no room for no more men. It is pretty near time to go out to the ballpark, and I wish you could be here, Al, and hear them San Francisco fans go crazy when they hear my name announced to pitch. I bet they wish they had of had me here this last year. Yours truly, Jack. Medford, Oregon, November 16. Friend Al. Well, Al, you know by this time that I did not pitch the whole game in San Francisco, but I was not taken out because they was hitting me, Al, but because my arm went back on me all of a sudden. And it was the change in the climate that done it to me, and they could not hire me to try and pitch another game in San Francisco. They was the biggest crowd there that I ever seen in San Francisco, and I guess they must have been 40,000 people there, and I wish you could have heard them yell when my name was announced to pitch. But, Al, I would not never have went in there but for the crowd. My arm felt like a wet rag or something, and I knowed I would not have nothing. And besides, the people was packed in around the field, and they had to have ground rules. So when a man hit a fly ball, it went into the crowd somewheres and was a two-bagger. And all them giants could do against me was pop my fastball up in the air, and then the wind took hold of it and dropped it into the crowd, the lucky stiffs. Doyle hit three of them pop-ups into the crowd, so when you see them three two-base hits opposite his name and the score, you will know they was not no real two-base hits, and the infielders would have catched them had it not have been for the wind. This here Doyle takes a awful wallop in a ball, but if I was right and he swang at a ball the way he done in San Francisco, 
the catcher would already be throwing me back the ball about the time this here Doyle was swinging at it. I can make him look like a sucker, and I done it both in Kansas City and Bonham, and if he will get up there and bat against me when I feel good, and when there is not no wind blowing, I will bet him a $25 suit of clothes that he can't foul one off of me. Well, when Callahan seen how bad my arm was, he says, I guess I should ought to take you out and not run no chance of you getting killed in there. And so I quit, and Faber went in to finish it up, because it don't make no difference if he hurts his arm or not. But I guess McGraw knowed my arm was sore too, because he did not try and kid me like he done that day in Shy, because he has saw enough of me since then to know I can make his club look rotten when I am okay and my arm is good. On the train that night, he come up and says to me, Well, Jack, we catched you off your stride today, or you would have gave us a beating. And then he says, What your arm needs is more work, and you should ought to make the whole trip with us, and then you would be in fine shape for next year. But I says, You can't get me to make no trip, so you might as well not do no more talking about it. And then he says, Well, I am sorry. And the girls over in Paris will be sorry, too. But I guess he was just joking about the last part of it. Well, Al, we go to one more town in Oregon, and then to Washington. But, of course, it is not the same Washington we play at in the summer. But this is the state Washington, and have not got no big league club. And the boys gets their boat in four more days, and I will quit them. And then I will come straight back to Shy and from there to Bedford. Your pal, Jack. Portland, Oregon, November 17. Friend Al. I have just wrote a long letter to Flory, but I feel like as if I should ought to write to you, because I won't have no more chance for a long while. That is, I won't have no more chance to mail a letter, because I will be on the Pacific Ocean, and unless we should run past the boat that was coming the other way, there would not be no chance of getting no letter mailed. Old pal, I am going to make the whole trip clear around the world and back and so I won't see you this winter after all but when I do see you Al I will have a lot to tell you about my trip and besides I will write you a letter about it from every place we head in at I guess you will be surprised about me changing my mind and making the whole trip but there was not no way for me to get out of it and I will tell you how it all come off while we was still in that there Medford yesterday McGraw and Callahan come up to me and says, Was they not no chance of me changing my mind about making the whole trip? I says, No, they was not. Then Callahan says, Well, I don't know what we're going to do then. And I says, Why? And he says, Comiskey just got a letter from President Wilson, the President of the United States. And in the letter, President Wilson says, He got another letter from the King of Japan, who says that they would not stand for the White Sox and Giants coming to Japan unless they brought all their stars along. And President Wilson says they would have to take their stars along because he was a scared if they did not take their stars along. Japan would get mad at the United States and start a war, and then where would we be at? So Comiskey wired a telegram to President Wilson and says Matthewson could not make the trip because he was so old, but would everything be all okay if I was to go along? And President Wilson wired a telegram back and says, yes, he had been talking to the priest from Japan, and he says, yes, it would be all okay. I asked him would they show me the letter from President Wilson because I thought maybe they might be kidding me, and they says they could not show me no letter because when Comiskey got the letter, he got so mad that he tore it up. Well, Al, I finally says I did not want to break up their trip, but I knowed Flory would not stand for letting me go, so Callahan says, All right, I will wire a telegram to a friend of mine in Shoy and have him get a hold of Allen and send him out here, and we will take him along. And I says, It is too late for Allen to get here in time, and McGraw says, no, they was a train that only took two days from Shy to wherever it was the boat is going to sail from, because the train come around through Canada, and it was downhill all the way. Then I says, well, if you will wire a telegram to my wife and fix things up with her, I will go along with you. 
but if she is going to make a holler it is all off so we all three went to the telegram office together and we wired florrie a telegram that must have cost two dollars but callahan and mcgraw paid for it out of their own pocket and then he waited around a long time and the answer come back and the answer was longer than the telegram we wired and it says it would not make no difference to her but she did not know if the baby would make a holler but he was hollering most of the time anyway so that would not make no difference but if she let me go it was on condition that her and the allens could get a flat together and stay in shy all winter and not go to no bedford and hire a nurse to take care of the baby and if i would send her a check for the money i had in the bank so as she could put it in her name and draw it out when she needed well i says at first i would not stand for nothing like that but callahan and mcgraw showed me where i was making a mistake not going when i could see all them different countries and tell florrie about the trip when i come back and then in a year or two when the baby was a little older i could make another trip and take little al and florrie along so i finally says okay i would go and we wires still another telegram to florrie and told her okay and then i sat down and wrote her a check for half the money i got in the bank and i got five hundred altogether there so i wrote the check for half of that or two hundred fifty dollars and mailed it to her and if she can't get along on that she would be a awful spendthrift because i am not only going to be away until march you should ought to have heard the boys cheer when callahan tells them i am going to make the whole trip but when he tells them i am going to pitch for the giants and not for the white Sox, i bet crawford and speaker and them wished i was to stay home but it is just like callahan says if they bat against me all winter the pitchers they bat against next seasons will look easy to them and you won't be surprised al if crawford and speaker hits about five hundred next year and if they hit good you will know why it is steve evans asked me was i all fixed up with clothes and i says no but i was going out and buy some clothes including a full dress suit of evening clothes and he says you don't need no full dress suit of evening clothes because you look funny enough without em this evans is a great kidder al and nobody never gets sore at the stuff he pulls something like kid gleason i wish kid gleason was going on the trip al but i will tell him all about it when i come back well al old pal i wished you was going along too and i bet we could have the time of our life but i will write to you right along al and i will send bertha some postcards from the different places we had in at i will try and write you a letter on the boat and mail it as soon as we get to the first station which is either japan or yokohama i forget which Goodbye, Al, and say goodbye to Bertha for me, and tell her how sorry I and Flory is that we can't come to Bedford this winter, but we will spend all the rest of the winters there, and her and Flory will have plenty of time to get acquainted. Goodbye, old pal. Your pal, Jack. Seattle, Washington, November 18. Al. Well, Al, it is all off, and I am not going on no trip around the world and back, and I've been looking for Callahan or McGraw for the last half hour to tell them I have changed my mind and I'm not going to make no trip because it would not be fair to Flory. And besides that, I think I should ought to stay home and take care of little Al and not leave him to be taken care of by no train nurse because how do I know what she would do to him? And I am not going to tell Flory nothing about it, but I am going to take the train tomorrow night right back to Shy and surprise her when I get there and I bet both her and little Al will be tickled to death to see me. I suppose McGraw and Callahan will be sore at me for a while, but when I tell them I want to do the right thing and not give my family no raw deal, I guess they will see where I am right. We was to play two games here, and I was to play one of them in Tacoma and the other here, but it rained, and so we did not play neither one, and the people was pretty mad about it because I was announced to pitch, and they figured probably this would be their only chance to see me in action. And they made an awful holler, but Comiskey says no, they would not be no game, because the field neither here nor in Tacoma was in no shape for a game, and he would not take no chance of me pitching and maybe slipping in the mud and straining myself. And then where would the White Sox be at next season? So we've been laying around all the PM, 
and I and Dutch Schaefer had a long talk together while some of the rest of the boys was out buying some clothes to take on the trip and Al I bought a full dress suit of evening clothes at Portland yesterday and now I owe Callahan the money for them and I'm not going on no trip so probably I won't never get to wear them and it is just forty five dollars throwed away but I would rather throw forty five dollars away than go on a trip around the world and leave my family all winter well Al I and Schaefer was talking together and he says well maybe this is the last time we will ever see the good old U.S. and I says what do you mean and he says people that goes across the Pacific Ocean most generally always has their shipwrecked and then there is not no more ever heard from them then he asked me was I a good swimmer and I says yes I had swam a good deal in the river and he says yes you have swam in the river but that is not nothing like swimming in the Pacific Ocean because when you swim in the Pacific Ocean you can't move your feet because if you move your feet the sharks come up to the top of the water and bites at them even if they did not bite your feet clean off their bite is poison and gives you the hydrophobia and when you get that you start barking like a dog and the water runs into your mouth and chokes you to death then he says of course if you can swim without using your feet you are all okay but there is very few that can do that and especially in the pacific ocean because they got to keep using their hands all the time to scare the swordfish away so when you don't dare use your feet and your hands is busy you got nothing left to swim with but your stomach muscles then he says you should ought to get along okay because your stomach muscles should ought to be strong from the exercises they get so I guess there is not no danger from a man like you, but men like Wilt C. and Mike Donnan that is not hog fat like you is not got no chance. Then he says, Of course, there have been times when the boats got across all okay and only a few lives lost, but it don't often happen. And the time the old Minneapolis club made the trip, the boat went down, and the only thing that was saved was the catcher's protector that was full of air and could not do nothing else but float. Then he says, Maybe you would float too if you did not say nothing for a few days. I asked him how far would a man got to swim if something went wrong with the boat, and he says, Oh, not far, because there is a whole lot of islands along the way that a man could swim to, but it would not do a man no good to swim to these here islands because they don't have nothing to eat on them and a man would probably starve to death unless he happened to swim to the sandwich islands then he says well, by the time you've been out on the pacific ocean a few months you won't care if you get anything to eat or not i says why not and he says the pacific ocean is so rough that nothing can set still not even the stuff you eat I asked him how long did it take to make the trip across if they was not no shipwreck and he says they should ought to get across along in February if the weather was good. I says well if we don't get there until February we won't have no time to train for next season and he says you won't need to do no training because this trip will take all the weight off of you and everything else you got. Then he says but you should not always be scared of getting seasick because there is one way you can get away from it, and that is to eat nothing at all while you are on the boat. And they tell me you don't eat hardly nothing anyway, so you won't miss it. Then he says, Of course, if we should have good luck and not get into no shipwreck, and not get shot by one of them warships, we will have a great time when we get across, because all the girls in Europe and them places is nuts over ball players, and especially stars. I asked what did he mean saying we might get shot by one of them warships and he says well, we would have to pass by Switzerland and the Switzerland warships was all the time shooting all over the ocean and of course they was not trying to hit nobody but they was as wild as most of them left handers and how could you tell what they was going to do next. Well Al after I got through talking to Schaefer I run into Jack Sheridan the umpire and I says I did not think I would go on no trip and I told him some of the things Schaefer was telling me and Sheridan says Schaefer was kidding me and they was not no danger at all and of course Al I did not believe half of what Schaefer was telling me and that has not got nothing to do with me changing my mind but I don't think it is not hardly fair for me to go away on a trip like that 
and leave Flory and the baby and suppose some of them things really did happen like Schaefer said though of course he was kidding me but if one of them was to happen they would not be nobody left to take care of Flory and little Al and I got a thousand dollar insurance policy but how do I know after I am dead if the insurance company comes across and gives my family the money well Al I will mail this letter and then try again and find McGraw and Callahan and then I will look up a timetable and see what train can I get to shy. I don't know yet when I will be in Bedford, and maybe Flory has hired a flat already, but the Allens can live in it by themselves, and if Allen says anything about I paying for half of the rent, I will bust his jaw. Your pal Jack. Victoria, Canada, November 19. Dear old Al, Well, old pal, the boat goes tonight, and I am going along and I would not be taking no time to write this letter, only I wrote to you yesterday and says I was not going, and you probably would be expecting to see me blow in to Bedford in a few days. And besides, Al, I got a whole lot of things to ask you to do for me if anything happens, and I want to tell you how it come about that I changed my mind and am going on the trip. I am glad now that I did not write Flory no letter yesterday and tell her I was not going, because now I would have to write her another letter and tell her I was going, and she would be expecting to see me the day after she got the first letter, and instead of seeing me, she would get the second letter and not me at all. I have already wrote her a goodbye letter today, though, and while I was writing it out, I almost broke down and cried, and especially when I thought about leaving little Al so long, and maybe when I see him again, he won't be no baby no more, or maybe something will have happened to him or that train nurse did something to him, or maybe I won't never see him again no more, because it is pretty near a cinch that something will either happen to I or him. I would give almost anything I got, Al, to be back in shy with little Al and Flory, and I wish she had not have never wired that telegram telling me I could make the trip. And if something happens to me, think how she will feel whenever she thinks about wiring me that telegram, and she will feel almost like as if she was a murderer. Well, Al, after I had wrote you that letter yesterday, I found Callahan and McGraw, and I told them I have changed my mind and am not going on no trip. Callahan says, What's the matter? And I says, I don't think it would be fair to my wife and baby. And Callahan says, Your wife says it would be all okay, because I seen the telegram myself. I says, yes, but she don't know how dangerous the trip is. And he says, who's been kidding you? And I says, they has not nobody been kidding me. I says, Dutch Schaefer told me a whole lot of stuff, but I did not believe none of it. And that has not got nothing to do with it. I says, I am not as scared of nothing, but suppose something should happen, and then where would my wife and baby be at? Then Callahan says, Schaefer has been giving you a whole lot of hot air, and there is not no more danger on this trip than there is in bed. You've been in a whole lot more danger when you was pitching some of them days when you had a sore arm, and you would be taking more chances of getting killed in shoy by one of them taxi cabs or the dog catcher than on the ocean. This here boat we are going on in is the umpires of Japan, and it has went across the ocean a million times without nothing happening and they could not nothing happen to a boat that the New York Giants was riding on, because they is too lucky. Then I says, well, I have made up my mind to not go on no trip. And he says, all right, then, I guess we might as well call the trip off. And I says, why? And he says, you know what President Wilson says about Japan, and they won't stand for us coming over there without you along. And then McGraw says, Yes, it looks like the trip was off, because we don't want to take no chance of starting no war between Japan and the United States. Then Callahan says, You will be in fine with Comiskey if he has to call the trip off, because you are a scared of getting hit by a fish. Well, Al, we talked and argued for an hour or an hour and a half, and some of the rest of the boys come round and took Callahan and McGraw's side, and finally Callahan says it looked like as if they would have to postpone the trip a few days until he could get a hold of Allen or somebody and get them to take my place. So finally I says I would go because I would not want to break up no trip 
after they made all their plans and some of the players wives was all ready to go and would be disappointed if they was not no trip so McGraw and Callahan says that's the way to talk and so I am going Al and we are leaving tonight and maybe this is the last letter you will ever get from me but if they does not nothing happen Al I will write to you a lot of letters and tell you all about the trip but you must be looking for no more letters for a while until we get to Japan where I can mail a letter and maybe it's likely as not we won't never get to Japan. Here is the things I want to ask you to try and do, Al, and I'm not asking you to do nothing if we get through the trip all right. But if something happens and I should be drowned, here is what I am asking you to do for me, and that is to see that the insurance company don't skin Flory out of that $1,000 policy and see that she also gets that other $250 out of the bank and find her some place down in Bedford to live, if she is willing to live down there, because she can live there a whole lot cheaper than she can live in Shy. And besides, I know Bertha would treat her right and help her out all she could. Also, Al, I want you and Bertha to help take care of little Al until he grows up big enough to take care of himself. And if he looks like as if he was going to be left-handed, don't let him, Al, but make him use his right hand for everything. Well, Al, there is one good thing, and that is if I get drowned, Flory won't have to buy no lot in no cemetery and hire no hearse. Well, Al, old pal, you always been a good friend of mine, and I always tried to be a good friend of yourn. And if there was ever anything I done to you that was not okay, remember bygones is bygones. I want you to always think of me as your best old pal. Goodbye, old pal your old pal Jack. P.S. Al, if they should not nothing happen, and if we was to get across the ocean all okay, I am going to ask McGraw to let me work the first game against the White Sox in Japan, because I should certainly ought to be right after giving my arm a rest and not doing nothing at all on the trip across, and I bet if McGraw lets me work, Crawford and Speaker will wish the boat had have sank. You know me, Al. End of chapter 6 End of You Know Me Al by Ring Lardner Recording by Rick Rodstrom, 